don't know this young woman. But whether you want to or not, in this very moment, you've already passed judgment on her. In a split second, you've already decided if you find her trustworthy, competent, likable. No doubt your brain is a state-of-the-art marvel, managing 90% of everything you do without letting you know, regardless of whether you're awake or asleep. When you think you have an idea, your brain has already had that idea. For instance, take a look at this sentence. Can you still understand this alphabet soup? Most people can. Your brain automatically puts the letters back in the correct order. Something in your head navigates you through the everyday adventures of modern life. Something that decides things for you before you can think about it. Because your brain is always on automatic. We're driven by our unconscious mind. Isn't that the interesting thing? So much of what we do is unconscious. The decisions we make are almost dictated to us. Um, I often wonder who's in charge here. You know, who's running the show? How much control do we really have? Unconscious influences are there everywhere. And as research progresses, it's never going the other way. It's not saying, oh, we used to think these things were all unconscious. Now they're, we find out they're conscious. It's exactly the opposite. All these things we thought, because we thought everything was conscious, smaller, 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 has become the incredible shrinking little man in the head. There's all sorts of gaps in our perception and, and outright confabulations that our brains are making for us in order for us to exist because it's easier to do that than actually to try and make an accurate representation of the world. It's faster and easier for us to estimate what the world's going to look like because it usually works just fine. However, some people are out to fool us on purpose. People like Apollo Robbins, a magician, and the gentleman thief of the desert town Las Vegas. Apollo not only deceives our eyes, but more importantly, our brains. On a good day, Apollo even steals the show from the city of illusions itself, his adopted home, Las Vegas. Apollo shot to fame in the Caesars Palace Casino. Once he even snatched wallets and watches from Secret Service agents guarding former President Jimmy Carter. Ever since then, Apollo also consults security experts. Magicians like Apollo Robbins take advantage of our automatic mode that otherwise, like an autopilot, navigates us smoothly through life. Magic is about what's happening inside the head. It's about how you manipulate the attention. It's about how that can be taken advantage of, how you can take people on this journey. If you watch my hand right now, you see that my hand is very clearly empty. I don't reach up with another hand, yet now I have a coin inside the hand. That means you just made a false assumption about something about my hand. What you are as a human is a bunch of electrochemical signals going around a bunch of circuits inside your brain. There's no windows in your skull. Okay? The only way you get information in is through your sensory systems, from your memory, or from your cognition. That is, you making it up. Okay? So what these electrochemical signals see about the world are other electrochemical signals coming in from other systems that form this grand simulation of reality around us. So, you know, it's not that the world around you isn't there, it's there, but you've never lived there, okay? You've never even been there for a visit. The only place you've ever been is inside your mind. Every morning when we open our eyes, unconscious circuitry conjures a simulation we perceive as our world. 
In this great illusion, in our mind's eye, the only part we appear to operate actively is where we consciously place our attention. If this young man happens to meet the love of his life today, he will only realize it if his unconscious mind shares the same view. Do you know, for example, how exactly you brush your teeth? No. Your brain attends to such routine things without even bothering you. Your consciousness only switches on for new or important things. That is because we can cope with no more than four or five units of information at the same time. For those who don't want to believe this, American Clifford Pickover has invented the perfect test. Pick one of the symbols and count how many times it blinks. Now pick a card. Take a very close look at it and repeat to yourself the suit and the value three times. Then look back at one of the symbols below and count how often it blinks. And now, have a look. We removed your card, right? A miracle? No. We just replaced all the cards. Here are the originals. You simply didn't notice because your working memory was overloaded. Suppressing those things in front of us that we don't pay attention to is something that we do all the time. And most of the times, we do it unconsciously. We don't realize that there are huge portions of the world that we are turning invisible by the very act of paying attention to a particular object or a particular task. Deciding on the right clothes for the office may appear trivial. However, unconscious circuitry in our heads will always have the last word. Scientists estimate that these circuits can simultaneously process 200,000 times more data than the conscious mind. That's because our conscious mind is limited to the cerebral cortex, a wrinkled layer, just one millimeter thick, that wraps around your brain like a bathing cap. About 15 billion nerve cells can connect to activate new networks in fractions of a second. However, the fireworks of conscious thinking devours up more energy than the muscles of a top athlete. Which is why our brain normally tries to do without our conscious mind. The brainstem regulates vital bodily functions like breathing and heart rate. The cerebellum coordinates all motoric routines like walking or grasping. And the limbic system knows us better than we know ourselves because it regulates everything that we feel. And this unconscious filter, the thalamus, is in charge of deciding what is new and important enough to share with us. That's why our brain always seems to know more than we know. Perhaps that's the reason why we have so little influence on that which we are, and what we do, and even on what we wear. Apollo Robbins and other magicians help scientists understand how our brain perceives the world. At the Barrow Institute in Phoenix, even the slightest eye movements are captured with these eye trackers. This helps researchers understand why tricks with curved movements work better than straight movements. With curves, the eye automatically follows the hand. With straight line movements, it jumps to the end, which helps uncover the trick. Susanna Martinez Conde and Stephen Macknick have studied dozens of magic tricks. The married research couple says illusions are the rule in our heads, not the exception.
Magic Tony from Phoenix is a part-time magician, but also a postgraduate in psychology. That's why he sometimes performs in the lab. Test persons follow his tricks with up to 1,000 eye movements a second, and yet they still don't notice how they're being cheated. Tony purposely diverts their attention. We apparently can't help but follow other people's gazes. So magicians may use explosions or things like that in order to cause distractions at times, but for the most part they use very specific tools in order to control exactly where someone will be paying attention so that they can do something somewhere else. Even if our eyes happen to graze the hidden movement, we look, but we don't see the trick. Because our brain suppresses everything that's not in the spotlight of our attention. And in the shadows of the supposedly irrelevant, Tony moves the coin with a magnet under the table. It's really most of our mental life and behavior is a mixture. It's a combination of, of processes that are conscious and unconscious in a sort of symbiotic, dynamic way. They're supporting each other. Um, and this is, this is how consciousness evolved. It, it evolved late, but it evolved making use of the pre-existing brain structures that were unconscious. Uh, and so many similarities exist between conscious and unconscious processes, especially in motivation and goal pursuit. The Bing Nursery School, a kind of research kindergarten for the elite Stanford University near San Francisco. The marshmallow test was invented here in the early 70s and is still one of the most important studies about self-control and motivation. We brought the test back to life with kids of today, putting these four-year-olds in a sticky situation. So in this part of the game, we're going to have two plates here. And look, one and two marshmallows there. Do you prefer two marshmallows or one marshmallow? Two marshmallows. Two marshmallows, okay. You don't want two? Okay. Two. Two marshmallows, okay. What's gonna happen is that I need to go do some work outside. But you can always bring me back by ringing the bell, remember? But if you do that, you can only eat one marshmallow. If you wait for me to come back all by myself, then you can have two marshmallows. Okay. And there's no right or wrong way to do this. You just choose what you want to do. Okay. See you later. As with the original test, something in the children's head switches to automatic. Each of the four-year-olds develop their own unconscious strategy in order to resist temptation. In the 70s, scientists had no idea what caused some children to give up and others to stick it out. But it's a surprisingly simple trick of our unconscious mind. I divided 
Do they actually need one to one? Okay. Yeah, you rung the bell, so you get to eat this one. One. Is that yummy? The conception of willpower as a stoic thing where you essentially bite your lip and you're just going to will it and make it happen is a terrific way to have resolutions that don't work out. It's just too hard. It's just too impossible. You have to do, you have to in some way engage the environment and change it and transform it. And the only other thing you can do is change your perceptions and change where you put your attention. Today, the preschoolers tested in the early 70s are over 40 years old. From ongoing interviews, researchers found those who at the age of four were able to wait, went on to have better results on college entry exams, earn much more money, have happier marriages, and are healthier than those who immediately devoured the marshmallow. <laughs> all right, well, we're all done. Thanks for playing. Most of the time it works just perfect for us when our automatic brain attends to everyday routines. That's why we can eat, descend the stairs, and read the newspaper all at once. Our unconscious tells us what we want for breakfast and whether we'd rather have coffee or tea before we even think about it. It analyzes spectacular amounts of data in milliseconds. It's far more complex than any deliberate decision of the conscious mind. But we don't notice this ocean of the unconscious because it is only conscious thinking that taxes us. And this makes us believe that our intellect rules the world. Devouring fruits and yogurt on the go is not a problem for our unconscious circuitry, nor is the intricacies of driving. If we had to constantly think about our hands and feet as if it was our first driving lesson, most of us would rather take the train. Did you know that accidents with cyclists happen less frequently in cities with lots of cyclists? The more often we are confronted with them, the better our autopilot can deal with them. With new dangers in contrast, our heads switch over to reasoning. That makes us much more flexible, but also much slower. Interestingly, we always live in the past, as everything we consciously perceive has already passed by at least a third of a second. This delay of consciousness has huge consequences, especially regarding our reaction time and road traffic. Interestingly, we do not consciously perceive this delay. We do not experience the work of our unconscious mind. We believe we experience it immediately. Whenever we look at something, a bundle of light rays passes through our pupil and hits the retina of our eyes. The new data is encrypted into millions of nerve impulses that race along the optic nerve. 50 milliseconds later, they hit the nerve cells in the thalamus, the gatekeeper of our consciousness. In an emergency, the thalamus transmits the image not just to the visual cortex at the back of our heads, but simultaneously to the amygdala, the panic button in our heads. It immediately jolts us into action. And after just 150 milliseconds, we get going without knowing why. Next, unconscious modules disassemble the image into components. Special neurons analyze colors, outlines, 
contrasts and send the results through the databases of our experiences. From the visual cortex at the back of our heads to the frontal lobe, here, in a flash, all bits and pieces are reassembled to a meaningful image and transmitted back to the visual cortex. Now, from this moment on, we can consciously see the image. A child running after a ball out onto the street, pre-evaluated and projected 300 milliseconds into the future. Which is the simple reason why Martha is able to catch the boy in the nick of time. If you hold your thumb out at arm's length with your elbow straight and you look at your thumbnail, that size of your thumbnail is about one degree of visual angle. Okay? That means if you had 360 thumbs, it would make a circle around your head. Now that one degree of visual angle is the size of your phobia. That's the part of your retina where you can see. Everywhere else, you're essentially legally blind. <laughs> In general, the most important means of our perception is our memory. 99% of what we see is projected from our memory. And only 1% is added by our sensory organs. Our brain can falsify information that comes onto the retina. It can falsify it. In other words, if we can override what is really out there and impress what we ex think should be out there. That's the way it works. It's very powerful. Let's take a look at Leander and Raphael. The two students are wearing similar clothing, have a similar stature, but are different enough to tell apart. Do you think you would notice if Raphael started a conversation with you and in the middle of it was replaced by Leander? Yes? Then take a look at the test devised by American psychologist Daniel Simons. Excuse me, I'm looking for a fox bank. Sorry, fox bank. I'm looking for a fox bank. Fox bank. Yep. Yeah. Let me think. Where is it? Um, it's almost slapstick here. Yeah, there is one around the corner, up at uh, Market Square. Excuse me, I'm looking for Silver Street. I don't have a clue where I am. So could you show it to me once again? You gotta walk up Helvig. Down there and there to the left. Down there and then left. All the way up Helvig. I'm looking I'm looking for Silver Street. Do you know where it is? Silver Street. Silver Street. Um so, do you know... Yeah, let me see. We're here. That's where you want to go. Is there a Fox Bank uh, somewhere here? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. have a map here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for Silver Street. Uh, I'm looking for Silver Street. Um, I have to admit I'm not from here either. Uh huh. Okay. So, Silver Street. In case you think we faked this experiment, it first took place on an American university campus in 1998. It has since been conducted countless times, and in all the tests, more than half of the people approached didn't notice anything at all. You go to a doctor's office, and you say, I have a pain in my stomach. And you don't want them to say, well, it could be aliens running around. Because it could be, right? Why couldn't it be? You want them to go through what's most likely down the list, right? And that's what our brain does. The whole cognitive structure is we look at the world, we make mindsets of what's familiar, and we look out of the world in these mindsets. Our world is getting more and more complex. An American psychologist calculated that today the human brain can simultaneously absorb 11 million units of information. However, we're only consciously aware of a maximum of 40. That's why New York is exhausting when we first visit it. But the more often we venture into places like Times Square, the more at ease we feel with it. That's because we shift to autopilot. 
and our brain fades out what is considered irrelevant or familiar. Half of your brain is dedicated to processing visual information. So that means that a quarter of your uh, brain at least is just for that 0.1%. If you amplified that up and we saw everything in the world so that we didn't have a fovea, just our entire visual field was one big high resolution fovea, our brain would have to be at least 500 times bigger in order to process all that information. And still we'd have attention picking out pieces of it for us. To prove this, psychologist Daniel Simons thought up this test. Count how many times the white team passes the ball. And go. Even if you did happen to notice something, half of all test persons overlooked the gorilla. They were blind to the black gorilla because they were too busy counting the white team's passes. Our brain decides which information is new and important enough without us even knowing. So when on the escalator of life, we're lucky if our unconscious mind lets us know we're passing the love of our life. The unconscious uh, specializes in is the present. Consciousness can time travel. We can remember the past. We can get lost in the past. We can we can plan for the future. But what's minding? What system is minding the store while we're off in the future and thinking about the past? While we're walking down the street, we have to be aware of what's going on in our environment. We have to be adapting to it. So what the unconscious is is a present-based system and because it's operating at the same time the conscious thought is, it, it frees the conscious mind to time travel. If the conscious mind was the only one that existed, as soon as we time travel, we're going to walk off a cliff. We're going to get hit by a car. We're going to have all these other things happen to us because we're not minding the present. And the present yeah. is a dangerous thing. It is our autopilot that decides what is important and what gets ignored. That's why we don't notice that our brain blanks out the grip of our sunglasses as long as they don't move on our heads. We get so used to them, we even have to check to make sure they're still there. to think of our mind kind of working like a watchtower. If you want to get by the tower, uh, you have to get by the guard. But the guard, if he's not paying attention to the surveillance systems and the inputs that he has, then he can be suppressed. And I think that's what happened when I'm working. I'm trying to get people not to pay attention to what their eyes are telling them or what their ears are telling them. Now you have nothing in your hand besides just the watch you're wearing. Yeah. Now do you think it's possible for me to steal that watch without you knowing? 
That's good. Because if I told you, that'd be rather foolish for me to do before I tried to do it. Make my job a lot harder. Now, what time do you have right now? At 11.03. Okay. So instead of taking your watch, I'm going to give you something of mine. I'm going to try to steal it away from you. This is mine. It's worth about $50. It's a silver coin. Squeeze it in your hand. Does it feel like it's in your hand? Yeah. Would you be surprised if I could take it out? Yeah. Good. Open your hand. That's the easy way. Don't make it easy for me. <laughs> make it hard for me. Hold your hand up a little bit higher, just a little bit flat like that. Watch it kind of close. So you see it goes straight away. It's back on his shoulder again. Do you see it on your shoulder? Hey, whoop. Keep on doing this till you catch it. You're almost there. You try it again. One last time. Squeeze it very tight inside your hand. Squeeze firm. Don't pull my fingers. That's a different trick. I've seen that one before. It's back on your shoulder, bro. The other shoulder. It's not there, is it, man? Is it? Show him it's not here. Open your hand all the way. Step back a little bit so he can see. See, you have to watch close. Put your other hand on top for me, would you? Put it flat on top. You see the coin right there? I'm going to put a shade in between. You have to watch close. It's not there yet. It's more about the timing. This is going to happen in less than three minutes. It's going to go in between your hands. Do you feel it now? Watch it close. Here it goes. One, two. Did you feel it? Open your hand. Well, I guess we ended up with a watch instead, didn't we? And that was less than three minutes. I think I told you about this, didn't I? This guy. You can take the watch along with a big round of applause from all your new fans. You're awesome, man. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's back on your shoulder, Brendan. Not yet. It's the other shoulder, that's why. Does it feel like it's inside your hand? Sure, it's definitely not there. You have to watch close. This trick's more about the timing. Everybody can see pretty well. Now I'm just going to loosen you up a little bit. You, you right, okay there? Good looking. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Does that feel about right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So now put this in between your hands. Squeeze kind of tight. Okay. Just a little bit like this. Is the top button done on your shirt there, man? No. And this is your watch, isn't it, man? Is that your watch? Oh! <laughs> so strange, it? <laughs> <laughs> that was just like your watch, doesn't it? That's so strange. Is this your watch? Yeah. What's your name? Ben. Ben, I appreciate the donation. You've been wonderful, man. In fact, we have picked up something special. We got your tie. Oh, shit. I believe that's your tie, isn't it, man? <laughs> right. Uh, sorry about that. Let's put okay, that over okay, your neck. Right. And in fact, we all got together to pay you for your time. I believe this is your cash. Is that your ah! <laughs> Because I think these are all the ones that were inside the pack. Oh, this is all Let's put it all here in a safe spot. That's you, bro. It's the best watch we can find on short notice. That looks a lot like it. <laughs> That's a heavy ass watch. I have no idea. When we stare at a bright light and then we turn our gaze away and we can still see this very powerful after image wherever we move our eyes. In the sense of touch, it's something similar. After Apollo actually removes the watch because he has pressed the watch into that person's skin previously, they can feel that they're still wearing the watch, even though the watch is long gone. We can dreamwalk effortlessly through our world only because every experience leaves an imprint in our unconscious memory. This vast archive also guides us when we meet somebody for the first time because we have unconsciously generalized our earlier experiences with people. Less than 100 millisecond exposure to a face, novel face you've never seen before, is sufficient for people to make all kinds of decisions, like whether the person is trustworthy, whether the person is competent. It's not the case that these uh, inferences are necessarily accurate, but we nevertheless do them very rapidly. Alex Todorov has shown countless photos of faces to test subjects. His studies prove we pass judgments on faces so rapidly 
our conscious mind doesn't even have time to get involved. We underrate baby faces as incompetent but trustworthy. And we classify closely set eyes and a square chin as aggressive. When our reasoning eventually kicks in, we only get more confident in our assumptions, even if we are apparently wrong. Even if you don't intend to make judgments, even if you don't have the intention to evaluate the faces, nevertheless your brain is categorizing the faces, putting the face into specific categories. So in that sense, a lot of the processing is one could describe as automatic. I'm behind looking out, I'm not seeing my face. So I'm not as able to manage it and to, to present it, to, to make it so that you, you have what I want you to believe about me. Uh, and this is the the classic domain of nonverbal communication and the face is hugely important, it's so powerful, but we're just starting with Todorov's work and, and some other people, we're just starting to realize how powerful it is and uh, it's very hard to shake. For decades, scientists have tried to develop a software capable of what we do without effort, recognizing and interpreting faces. This specific module in the right temporal lobe is in charge of scanning faces. It takes only fractions of a second to match a face in front of you with your internal database of faces. Provided that the emotional records department in our insular cortex has marked the face with an emotion. Sometimes we even recognize a face we've seen only once. Facial expressions are composed of 43 active muscle units. If we look at all the possible combinations, it adds up to 3,000 meaningful facial expressions. Next to the facial recognition service, there's a facial expression department, capturing our counterparts' facial micro-movements and interpreting them. The reports, again, are sent to the evaluation unit in the insular cortex, the empathy center of our brain. Seeing a face, we think we can feel what our counterpart feels, because unconscious circuitry is forcing us to do so. But we can neither put it in words, nor control it. Anything that doesn't have a face is processed by the object recognition unit, coloured blue here. Autistic people also use the object unit when looking at a human face. For them, a face is just like a chair. That's why they seem to be blind to other people's emotions. We, in contrast, sometimes read too much into a face. We have done some uh, studies trying to predict political elections from facial appearance and generally you can predict about 70% of the elections based on a single glance at a face and these are judgments of people who don't know that they're looking at politicians at all so they're not familiar with the faces. Our faces decide how others perceive us, whether we win or lose elections, get hired for a job, go on that first date and our friends decide how we move. Studies of American college students revealed that female friends needed just a few milliseconds to unconsciously align their movements and gestures with one another. When a person sees without maybe even realizing it, you're doing the same thing they're doing or having the same body posture or same emotional reaction on your face to the same news, they think you're like them. They see similarity. They see you're reacting the same way they do. It actually increases empathy and bonding between people.
unconscious circuitry is also guiding us when we're out shopping. It tells us what we should buy and what we're willing to pay for it. Researchers discovered that credit cards sidestep the alarm system inside our heads. It gets alerted when we actually give away something. But the plastic card is passed back to us by the cashier. And we only notice we're in the red at the end of the month. Until then, we're safe in the illusion of having saved money by spending it on a sale. We experience illusions all the time. We never have or almost never have a perfect match between perception and reality. So in a way, everything or most of everything that we perceive is illusory. Henrik Ersen from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. The Swedish neurologist has proved that even our brilliant automatic brain can be fooled. His test setup is as simple as it is disturbing. The test person sees 3D images taken by a camera behind them. Ersen touches his subject and in sync with this, he makes the same movement into the camera. It may sound incredible, but the touch and the 3D image are apparently merged by our unconscious into one. And even if the test subject's conscious mind clearly recognizes the illusion, the sensation still cannot be denied. <laughs> it's only an illusion. body should be special, it should be something you can trust, the raw feeling. Well, you can't trust the feeling of your body, that is also a construction by the brain, just like the brain constructs uh, what we see. With a slightly modified setup, the test is even taken to the next level. This time, Ersen's colleague Valeria Petkova attaches the camera to a mannequin. The test setup seduces the female test person to look down at the male mannequin body, as if it were her own though she's only looking at a camera image. The stronger a subject reacts to touch, the more perfect the body swap works, no matter how absurd. Was it too disturbing? Yeah, because it really completely feels it, it's my body and you wanted to cut me. Um, we can take a, little we can take a break, yeah. These illusions, you can't think them away. You see a mannequin, it doesn't look like a real human body. Uh, and But still, when you touch it, and you see that touch, at the same time with the touch you feel, the brain just fuses the two signals and decides that, yeah, this must be my body. You know, the body roughly looks like my body. It's roughly in the right place. And the touches I feel and see happens at the same time. So the brain just makes up this interpretation. Yes, this is my body. There is a hierarchy of senses. The most powerful senses are the sense of touch and the sense of balance. All of our other senses are subordinate to these. If we wear glasses that turn everything upside down, then the world is reversed at first. But the sensory motor systems ensure that it all turns back around. Our sensory motoric dominates the visual, and the visual in turn dominates hearing. Don't believe it? Then take a moment to test the McGurk effect. In a second, you'll hear two different syllables, ba and fa. You can clearly differentiate between the two because you combine what you hear ba. with the lip movements ba. you see. Ba. 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 Next, you'll ba. see a split screen. Ba. If you look ba. back and forth, 
You'll hear ba when you look on the left and something else when you look on the right. Yet the sound remains the same. Ba. 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 Your brain doesn't even bother to let you know about the conflict. It automatically solves it. That's what magicians like Apollo Robbins take advantage of. You wouldn't even uncover Apollo's trick if you rewound the film. And the more you try, the less you notice. The show game doesn't work unless you have an emotional investment. So when you're just watching this and you take a shotgun guess, I think it's under number two, yes, you may be right. But if you have a vested interest where there's money on the table, you're going to prioritize where you choose, and that's where you can be taken advantage of. It's no wonder our first rendezvous gives us butterflies and makes us anxious. In milliseconds, our brain scans things like ratio of hips to waist, the color of the eyes, facial symmetry, and fragrance of the body, which in turn tells our subconscious whether our immune systems are a match. Researchers today know we're more likely to fall in love with people who are like us. We even tend to fall for partners with the same width of the nose, and for those who are roughly as smart as we are. 90% of our emotional communication is non-verbal, and the more a person imitates subconsciously our gestures and facial expressions, the more we like that person. It goes so far that we even tune into the same rhythm of breathing when we're speaking to a person that we like. In order for us to fall in love, our brain eagerly pours out hormones, clouding our judgment and making us downright addicted. Then, we only have one goal, being close to that person. Contrary to popular opinion, men fall in love more quickly and more definitively than women. But in each of us, our brains decide for us, long before we do. That's why there's an automatic error monitoring system in our heads that registers every mishap before it occurs. because our brains constantly calculate what will be happening next. If the motion detectors of our cerebral cortex register minor deviations from the plan, our unconscious alarm systems start up. The motivation department chokes the release of dopamine, the messenger substance anticipating all good things in our lives. The drop of dopamine is registered by the nucleus accumbens, a tiny interface constantly calculating what will make us happy or not. So before any mishap occurs, it alarms the ACC, a sort of fire alarm for our cerebral cortex. This in turn triggers a voltage drop within the conscious brain that jolts us awake, three tenths of a second after the first alarm. Errors feel bad for our brain. That's why we learn from them. In the next episode, you'll find out if things get really serious with our new love-struck couple, or if Martha and Jake's happiness is fragile. Firstly, you know, you look at someone, a potential partner, and you're integrating all kinds of things, the way she speaks, 
the way she looks, the way she, <laughs> the way every little motion is immediately integrated in some giant calculation saying, you know, acceptable, like her. And, you know, I find that interesting. You meet someone on the train and they're your partner and, and one week later. <laughs>